Hello, everyone. This is Disney Co. in the know, and this is our Harry Potter edition, episode one. I am your host, Bruce Beal, and I am joined by Disney Co. in the know contributors, Hannah. Hey, y'all. And Jacob. Hey. And Elizabeth. Hello. And before we get going on our special Harry Potter edition series, I just want to say that this show is brought to you by 407 Vacation, 407 and Beyond Vacation Company, Disney, and Universal vacation experts who help plan your perfect family vacation to take away the stress so all you have to do is show up have fun and create family memories okay guys i am looking forward to today's show um mm -hmm. it, for those listening and those watching a a, pre, a, a quick precursor to what we're going to be doing so we are going to take an examination um of harry potter and the sorcerer's stone or for the british edition the philosopher's stone and we are gonna be going chapter by chapter, drawing parallels to other parts of the book, to the theme parks, to the movies, and everything Harry Potter. So if you are new to the Harry Potter series and you do not want to know what happens next and what happens in the movies, um, do not listen now because this will be filled with spoilers, okay? So yeah. this is not a spoiler-free zone. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the chapter um, we're going to talk about our favorite parts, our favorite quotes, draw parallels, um, talk, analyze the chapter, and we plan on doing this um, on our Harry Potter edition, season one, all the way through the Philosopher's Stone. So with that, um, chapter one was, uh, was my undertaking this week. And so chapter one is titled, The Boy Who Lived. And it's uh, really an introduction to our characters. And we already start to get a sense of who's who and how this is uh, all going to start playing out. Um, the fun thing about this chapter is it takes place so many years in the past. So it takes place 10 years uh, before our story really gets going. And um, it's a really fun take. So I, I do want to um, say that at the beginning of the chapter, I think it's the first sentence or two. Um, it starts off with um, the Dursleys, and they say, we're perfectly normal, thank you very much. And I just thought that that was such a brilliant way to put it um, for the Dursleys, a brilliant, you know, you know sentence um, to display kind of the attitude that the Dursleys have, not only about Harry and what they learn uh, um, of Harry's kind, but at, of themselves. They have a very high opinion of themselves. They don't like anybody else except for them and those who they consider normal. Um, and, and the chapter kind of goes into that. So. And I feel like the, um, I mean, they say like perfectly normal also. And I feel like that perfectly too kind of just like pushes it that much further. Cause they talk about how, you know, Mrs. Dursley's always peering over the neck and gossip or peering with her long neck over the fence and gossiping about the neighbors. And even with the people who are normal, I feel like the Dursleys still think of themselves as a step above. And you're right, mm -hmm. it just like sets the tone for them so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's funny that the entire series starts with this sentence. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's focused on the Dursleys, um, but it is so, it, I mean, it's such a, a good way because we, we, we learn kind of the attitude already of the family who Harry has spent the last 10 years with. Mm -hmm. So well, yeah, it, it's yeah. a good introduction because the whole chapter, or not the whole chapter, the first chunk of the chapter is told through uh, Uncle Vernon's perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's a good way I feel like to introduce the readers to this world of magic is through the world of through the view of someone who isn't magic, through someone who's a muggle mm -hmm. like us, like people in the real world, someone who is perfectly normal. Like it's a good way to. Uh, started off and introduced those concepts and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. And, and to Jake's point, you know, the chapter, the first half is about Vernon Dursley um, and his mm -hmm. wife, Petunia, and son, Dudley. And, um, and it's just one of those typical mornings for the Dursleys, right? He wakes up, he's going to go to work, he gives his wife a kiss, um, he gets in his car, and the first thing he notices is a cat reading a map. And, and we learned mm -hmm. that that cat is Professor Minerva McGonagall, and she's sitting mm -hmm. there. Um, and, and he goes to work, and he thinks that that's strange. And then uh, he goes to work, and um, if you're, you're looking for a bit of trivia from Chapter 1, his, he works at a place called Grunnings, mm -hmm. and they make drills. Um, I feel like that's always a trivia. <laughs> good piece of trivia uh, right there. And so, um, so he goes to work, and while – 
on the way there and while he's at work, he's noticing people dressed in robes, wearing hats, um, acting what he considers funny. Um, mm -hmm. We would probably, you know, not notice it as much as the perfectly normal Vernon, you know, Dursley does. But, you know, he sees people who are cheery, dressed differently than he would dress. Um, and they are excited. And what they're excited about is, um, you know, Harry Potter um, kind of vanquishing the Dark Lord, um, you know, the, the night prior. Um, the Dark Lord, who, who Hagrid calls, he who must not be named. Um, Voldemort is gone. And so the people on the streets are, are cheering. So... Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a really good point that Jake made because that was one of my points too. I think this is the only time in the entire series where J.K. Rowling puts it at a perspective of someone other than Harry um, mm -hmm. in the book series, which I was like trying to think back um, when I was rereading the chapter and I really couldn't think of a time that she had done that. And so I think that's a really interesting perspective to see um, you know, kind of the world that we're going to be going into, um, and like the, and, you know, this is going to sound kind of, uh, looking at the parks when you walk in, um, to the park from either side of the park at Universal, you're going in from this world of muggles into the world of magic mm -hmm. and, you know, that transition. And she does that really well in the books and they do that really well in the parks, um, which just goes to credit how wonderful she writes how um she does that so well and i think this was a really good example of that yeah and i think it kind of like sets it up too for the way that harry experiences mm -hmm. the world of magic because like yes he was part of it as an infant but you know he doesn't really remember he's so young he doesn't know any of it so all he knows growing up is this muggle world and this looking down on things that are different mm -hmm. um before like really jumping into what it's like for wizards yeah. and like for the magical side of things. And so I think that starting the story out from like, you know, Vernon's point of view kind of gives us like a, a you know, a bit of taste of Harry's world too. Cause like what he knows first is just the Dursleys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Which so I Albus wanted him to have that, you, you know, he even says that in the chapter um, at, near the end of that first chapter, you know, he doesn't want his, you know, I forget the exact quote, but basically he doesn't want, he's already famous. He doesn't want him to like, know he's famous. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, I, I think that's a really cool perspective that she took on it because the book series could have gone a totally different way, obviously. Um, so it was cool that it was introduced that way in this chapter. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I want to ask you guys, so when, when Mr. Dursley is leaving in the morning and he's going to work and he notices the big tabby cat um, on the corner um, and it's reading a map. Why, why is Professor McGonagall reading a map? Is she looking for, for Pivot Drive? Is she just trying to do something to, I mean, cause obviously she's um, calling a little bit of attention to herself at, by a cat reading a map. So what do you, what do you think she's doing? That would be my assumption is making sure she's in the right place. Because if I recall correctly, uh, she she found out that that's where Dumbledore is going to be through Hagrid. I think like I don't mm -hmm. think Dumbledore asked her to be there. I think she she heard that from Hagrid. So I assume right. she's trying to make sure she's in the right place. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, that would be my guess as well. Is yeah, she she learned it through um, Hagrid, and I think that one of the things that I love about her is you can tell how much she really cares about like her students and that mm -hmm. like Lily from her reaction to like Lily and James's demise you can tell that she really cared about them especially mm -hmm. you know because being head of Gryffindor house and like you know they were her kids um and I like to I love her she's I think my favorite professor and I feel like she views the students like her own children maybe that's just kind of my take on things but I think that knowing what or suspecting what happened and then knowing where Dumbledore was going to end up I think she wanted to know that Harry was going to be safe there if that was mm -hmm. what was going to happen so she went and waited because I think she wanted to confront Dumbledore about what happened and she didn't know when he was going to show and yeah. she wanted to make sure that it was a place that would be fitting for Harry so mm -hmm. yeah okay so do you think that I was going to ask you guys that next is do you guys think that that is why she's there like, do you think that she's scoping out the Dursleys, thinking about oh, yeah. where Harry's going to be, or is she actually there to confirm 
what actually happened the night before with Elvis. Because when Dumbledore shows up, I think one of the first things she says is like, is it true? Um, what happened? Is it true about James and Lily um, and mm-hmm. their son? And so, you know, maybe she's there for both reasons, but like, I mean, do yeah. we, do we feel that she's there for both reasons, essentially? I think she's there for both reasons because they also both have to, they tie together. You know, Mm -hmm. he wouldn't be there to drop Harry off if everything that happened wasn't true. So in Mm -hmm. order to like confirm that that's a good place for Harry, she does have to first confirm that what actually happened happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is the, uh, the first time that we um, get to experience the, the power of the put outer. So (laughs) Albus carries the, or Dumbledore carries the, uh, Deluminator, but at you know, in chapter one, we learn it as the put outer, um, which is... takes takes the lights from the street lamps, which is a really cool scene in the movie too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, this is I think the only time we see it until uh, Ron gets it, right? I believe so. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think so as well. Until then, so which which is funny. This is the only time we hear of it. This is the only time that we see it until it is, uh, you know, bequeathed to Ron in the will. Um, and perhaps there's another time, but it's funny because when Ron does get it, um, we are, we, we're like so familiar with what it is. And yeah. Like, for, like it's such like a piece a, of like Harry Potter. Role. Yeah. It, it really, yeah. because it plays that part in the introduction to everything. Like that's one of the first magical items you yep. see in the series. Like that's one of the first things you associate with magic. So, so is it actually the first piece of magic that we're introduced to? Um, I think no. earlier Maga- the map disappears. I, I was going to point this out earlier when, uh, when uncle Vernon sees McGonagall reading the map, he like glances away and then glances back and it's gone. True. So there's some kind of magic involved there. Okay, but you know and what? The fact I wonder. That she's a cat. <laughs> I guess but, technically she is the first. Yeah. But we don't actually like get to see it or read the action of, and so we don't actually know that that's. Well, I mean, we know that that's Professor McGonagall, but as a reader reading this for the first time, we know it as the cat reading a map, and then Uncle Vernon does look back, and the map's gone. But we're not. We don't know that it's disappeared the very first time you read read the book. True, that's true. You think mm-hmm. so? I think the first this time is we the... actually read about magic happening currently, you know, in real time, I think might be the put outer. The the one other thing I was gonna put forth for this, and it was something I kind of wanted to bring up anyway, because I thought it was interesting. Is obviously before Dumbledore uses the put outer, he just appears out of nowhere in the middle of the street. Yeah. And the way it's described in the book, which I thought was really interesting, is he appears without a sound, mm. like out of nowhere. And but. <laughs> yeah, naturally, having <laughs> being familiar with the series and having read everything before, I'm sure most of you guys thought the same way I did, that he apparated mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you hear a crack. He, that's right. One of the characteristic yeah. things of apparition is the loud crack. Oh, so yeah. Conspicuously yeah. Uh, absent here. So... I don't know if that's just an, an instance of uh, not having planned ahead all the way or, or making little tweaks as uh, mm-hmm. as she goes along or what. But I just thought that was kind of an interesting uh, little thing there. Maybe it's some kind of magic that's not apparition. Like I wouldn't put that past Dumbledore either. So mm-hmm. Or Dumbledore is just such a strong and powerful wizard that he's able to apparate silently. Like maybe that's a whole nother level that she never really gets into. <laughs> Mm -hmm. on like skill because i mean mcgonagall straight up says to him at some point like that you know um he's the only one that voldemort was ever frightened of and dumbledore says like i'll never have those kind of powers and she says because you're too noble to use them Mm -hmm. so i feel like that's kind of hinting to um at like just like how great he is with magic so Mm -hmm. yeah i think um the one thing too i was you know when i was rereading this the first time i read this chapter was in fourth grade and so 22 years ago um which is crazy to think of how many times i've reread it but um the one thing that rereading it what i really noticed was how important this chapter was because there were so many things in it that you don't realize until you like serious black the um his motorcycle you know, I think there's elements of almost every single book in this first chapter um, that we have no idea that's going to be happening. So I thought that was really cool, um, like really looking at the book from this perspective to be able to be like, oh my gosh, like 
there is so much happening in this first chapter. It's kind of overwhelming um, in that sense, but it also shows how important it is, like we've said, to just set it up to make sure that it, it went off the correct way, because if it didn't, then we wouldn't probably have the Harry Potter series that we have, so. True. Yeah. I have to bring something up real quick. One of the things that kind of bothered me is, you know, McGonagall comes out of her cat form and Dumbledore's like, fancy seeing you here. And she's like, how did you know it was me? Like, she travels around Hogwarts all the time throughout the rest mm -hmm. of the series in her cat form. Mm -hmm. How would he not know it was her? Mm -hmm. I got that one too. Cat form a lot? At least I feel like in the movies they show her prowling around sometimes and... I don't know, maybe I've just, you know, spent too much time in, in Harry Potter groups online and stuff. Um, but you would think, I mean, if we're talking about Harry Potter, you know, bringing up even um, the Fantastic Beasts series and that supposable uh, Dumbledore McGonagall, like, interaction there and that, mm -hmm. they've known each other for a very long time. Right. He knows her. I mean, you would think that he would know, but I've yeah, also yeah. read some like jokes online that he can't tell her cat form from any other cats and that he oh. just like will talk to random cats thinking that it's her, which I think that's kind of a funny take on things too. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, and I, to that point a little bit, um, I do find it a little funny what McGonagall tells Dumbledore. So she's been sitting there all day outside of Four Pivot Drive you know, waiting for Hagrid to bring Harry. Um, she knows the plan, and Dumbledore shows up. They, they, they quickly talk, and then she goes, you know, he, Dumbledore says, I've come to bring Harry to his aunt and uncle. They're the only family he has left now. And she responds back with, you don't mean, you can't mean the people who live here. Well, of course he does. You've been sitting outside their house all day because you knew the plan. So, like, I know what she's, she, I know what she means, is, you know, I've been observing these people and they seem truly awful. How could we do it? But it's just kind of funny the way that she like quips back at, at Dumbledore with, you don't mean these people. Right. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, yeah. Cause you've been sitting outside their house all day. Right. Um, like you have just saying like, okay, there's gotta be some mistake. Like surely I was right. looking at the wrong people or something. Like, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Right. People. <laughs> right. And that, and or, that is what she, what she means. Or more, maybe more of like, I know I've been watching the right people and you can't be saying, surely you can't be serious. He's like, right. I'm not serious, mm -hmm. I'm Dumbledore. Um. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but speaking of serious and, and some of the stuff Elizabeth said earlier, I really do like how there's a lot of those little details uh, towards, towards stuff that occurs later on. Like it's really impressive just how planned out like everything was. Like you mm -hmm. see, you, you hear Sirius Black's name mentioned and, as a first time reader, I don't think you make anything of it. Like you immediately forget, uh -oh. oh, it's a name thrown mm -hmm. out, like Daedalus, right. Daedalus, or any of the others. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but, but like clearly she had everything planned quite a ways out, which I think is really cool. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's fun to see that stuff going back and reading it again. It makes mm -hmm. it really impressive. Yeah. And I kind of made that point, like when I read the word muggle, um, you know, nowadays, I mean, we use muggle because it's not magic folk but like back when you read it the first time and you're like you probably couldn't even pronounce it you're like is it muggle muggly like how do you say it you know right and so just even having that in there is cool speaking of pronunciation one cool thing that i always think about when i read the books again i mm -hmm. cannot remember for the life of me where i read this or heard this maybe you guys have heard the same thing but i i think i read somewhere one time that voldemort uh, was originally intended to have a silent T at the end. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, like kind of almost mm -hmm. a French sounding pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Yes. So every time I reread the books, I, I, I kind of like to think of it that way in my head just to see how it sounds and stuff. So I was thinking of mm -hmm. that re reading it again. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, have you guys thought about that at all or anything? Yeah, so, I have, um, just because I have listened to the audio versions quite a few times as well. I don't know if anyone else has. Mm -hmm. um, and um, if you haven't, I highly recommend listening to the audio version of it. It is like the movie. He does a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. um, the name is escaping me, but I know it's the gentleman who, um, oh, the name is escaping me. Who is it? Who reads it? But he will pronounce certain words throughout the entire series differently than how I say it. So it, it makes me wonder, like, Oh, how is that? How, how I think he likes to be. How is it meant to be said? Yeah, because in the first book, he does not say Hermione, Hermione. 
um, he does not call her that. Um, so it's, it's a little different, which is fun. Jim Dale. Yeah. Jim Dale. Yes. Thank yeah. you. I have the audio book. I haven't like gotten to listen to it yet. I just recently got it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we've touched on it, but I don't know if we fully fleshed out the, the plot point that um, Hagrid delivers Harry using Sirius's magical motorbike that flies. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and, and he he drops him off and he's there Hagrid is there the the keeper of keys um with Albus and McGonagall and uh Dumbledore has written a letter um to you know the the Dursleys that mm -hmm. you know they're dropping off Harry um and here he is you know good luck um and uh we see here Hagrid also get emotional um, dropping off Harry. Now, now Hagrid was friends with uh, James and Lily who have just passed, but I want to draw a connection here that it is these three characters, um, excluding Harry's friends that he meets at school, that will always have Harry's back, who always, you know, want to see what's, um, you know, help what's best for Harry. And mm -hmm. especially, you know, Hagrid. Hagrid becomes not only um, a keeper of keys, uh, of Hogwarts to Harry, but he becomes a professor, he becomes a friend, um, and he, you know, eventually turns into someone, you know, he does battle with, you know, on the same side, finding evil. And so Hagrid drops Harry off at this moment um, when Harry had nobody else, and Hagrid's there all the way through the series as kind of Harry's keeper. So mm -hmm. I think that's pretty cool. I think mm -hmm. um, something really interesting too to think about with these three characters and the way that they handle this specific situation and then to think about how they handle Harry and everything that he goes through through the rest of the series. You've got, you know, Dumbledore who has this big master plan and like, yeah, maybe putting Harry into not such a great situation, but it's for the greater good of what's happening. And when you think about like Harry having to go and find all of the Horcruxes and like, being a Horcrux himself and not knowing until the end and like the things that Dumbledore kind of puts him through in that journey. And I feel like you can kind of see that reflected in how he just handles Harry right from the get go. And yeah. McGonagall, um, you know, initially kind of tries to fight Dumbledore. Like, why are you putting him here? Why are you doing this? He's just a boy. He's just a kid, but then kind of does go along with it. Um, and like, as his professor, she like stands up for him as a student, um, but like she is his professor and like follows Dumbledore's guidance. But then you've got Hagrid and I feel like Hagrid is one of those characters who just like loves Harry and doesn't have his own agenda. And like you see him here like being upset that Harry's going off to live with muggles and like that kind of stuff. And really I feel like kind of trying to fight for like Harry not going there. Um, mm -hmm. And like, I feel like he, he really looks out for Harry's good to the best of his ability throughout the whole series. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing with those three. Yeah. And I want to pose um, a question as we get towards the end of the chapter here. And that is uh, McGonagall notices the scar on Harry's forehead. And uh, she says mm -hmm. to Dumbledore something to the effect of, well, couldn't you get rid of that? Or couldn't you change that or something? And he goes, no, and I wouldn't, even if I could, scars come in handy. Or I think the quote is, they can come in useful. Um, and, and so I wanted to ask you guys, when does Harry's scar become something that's useful to him? So, you know, the scar several times um, gives him warnings um, when Voldemort is either on the move or near him. Um, but there's also times when the scar gets him in trouble, like in the, when the Snatchers see them in the woods. And so I actually would think, well, you know, right now I, I'm posing that maybe it's actually more of a hindrance than a positive for Harry. Um, but, but, but play, play the, play the opposite here. What, what's the benefit to Harry that he has this lightning shaped, you know, scar on his forehead? Um, it's kind of one of the talking points that uh, he and Ron bond over when they first become friends, I feel like. Uh, mm -hmm before that when they like meet on the train and stuff that's kind of one of the first things they talk about if I remember correctly mm -hmm. uh, and it does like I don't know it does kind of like cast him out in a way so he just doesn't become just a normal wizard um so it's kind of like his symbol but I also think that Dumbledore I love Dumbledore he's one of my favorite characters so I don't want it to sound like but I also feel like in this 
first chapter that he really didn't know enough about it, but he tried to act like it in a way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, he like, did, oh, it could be important. Literally. Yeah. And he's just kind of saying that because he truly deep down has no idea because he doesn't know that Harry's a Horcrux. He doesn't even know about the Horcruxes, you know, like, right. I just think that he's trying to stay, oh. like, don't change anything because potentially this could come in handy. <laughs> you know, he doesn't know th- what could happen, like, that he will have a vision. He doesn't know that he's going to have a burning sensation and that's going to alert him that Voldemort's there. So I, I just think that he's, like, just trying to be like, no, it's not touching anything. <laughs> maybe. I, I don't know. I think maybe he doesn't know exactly about the Horcruxes, but I think he has a pretty good idea of Yeah, I would say everything. so. I, I get the impression that he he has a pretty good idea of everything that's gone on. He's just not saying, and maybe because he's not 100% sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, he does make that point um, in the first chapter about you know, when McGonagall says, I don't know, that Voldemort is gone, but he kind of makes a reference of, oh, you no, don't absolutely know for certain that he's gone. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Good I do point. agree with that. So. I feel like with the scar, it's like Harry's one connection he has left to the wizard world. Mm-hmm. And um, you kind of see it in some chapters coming up that people recognize him because of his scar and, like, thank him or show him kindness. So I'm going to argue that his scar comes in handy, like, right from the get-go, because the only people that he ever gets kindness from are these strangers that he doesn't even know, because of how mm-hmm. horrible, like, the Dursleys treat him. Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel like that scar and that connection to the wizarding world is, like, the one thing that, like, keeps him going. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I totally agree. I wasn't those. Oh, go ahead, Jacob. So I think he even says it's, like, the one thing he really likes about his appearance or something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So it probably played a bigger role maybe to his self-image or sense of self-worth or something uh, in that time skip span of 10 years or whatever where we don't really get to see much of his life. Mm -hmm. Right. That's true. And I can't wait to to talk about these 10 years, uh, you know, and chapters coming up. Um, But but we'll get to that. So um, does anyone else have anything left to say about this chapter? Hannah? Yes. So – with the parks, they just recently released the motorbike adventure. Was it mm-hmm. fall, I believe? 2019 fall? Yes. Um, and I think it's really interesting because when you think of all of the things that they could make a ride off of from these books, how did that not come about sooner? Because that motorcycle is such a key thing in the very beginning of the book. And then in the very last book, it's how Hagrid and Harry, like, you know, leave together to get to the borough is on that motorcycle and being such a bookend and important thing. I'm kind of surprised that they didn't make a ride about it sooner. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't disagree. I, I, I might think that it's, it was a budgetary decision because mm-hmm. Dueling Dragons, mm-hmm. you know, the original attraction there was kind of um, standard cookie cutters, had, but it had dragon trains. Um, so they obviously just swapped those out for the motorbike, which is so great because you can sit in the motorcycle part or the sidecar part and have mm-hmm. totally different experiences. Um, but the level of theming and the trees that they planted there and all of the immersiveness, um, I think probably lended itself to a project that came later. Um, so but, that makes yeah, I don't know. I don't know why it wouldn't, you know, be an original. It, it's funny because the, the motorbike really lends itself as a natural extension to a roller coaster. Like it fits mm-hmm. perfectly, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it is a, a great attraction, but mm-hmm. so, yeah. So, all right, well, let's wrap up this chapter by uh, giving our key takeaway. So Elizabeth, what's your key takeaway uh, from chapter one? Kind of like how I said at the beginning, I think chapter one really sets up the entire series, um, shows um, elements that we will see eventually. Um, if you're a first time reader reading it, you will have, you know, you might not even understand half of the chapter um, because of it, but I think it, she does such a great job of writing it that it keeps you wanting to, not to sound cliche, but like literally keep wanting to, you know, turn the page just to mm-hmm. see um, where this world and this wor- huge world that she has created. Um, and it just, this is, starts it off. All right. Jake, your takeaway from The Boy Who Lived? Um, kind of the same type of thing, actually. Yeah, it, it lays the groundwork really well for, for everything that comes. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's a good starting point for people who are unfamiliar with the series. Uh, it leads in well, but also for experienced viewers, you know, everything we, all the background information we know 
leads up and seamlessly flows into it and even the little details seamlessly flow into what's to come. So just really well-rounded uh, chapter. Very good. Hannah, your key takeaway. I would say like, obviously this infant, this child could defeat, you know, we don't even know the villain at this point, but you know from what McGonagall and Dumbledore say that he is powerful and he is, you know, has been terrorizing them for, I think they say 11 years. He's been, you know, terrorizing the wizarding world. And this, this infant saved everyone somehow. And I love that, you know, you know Harry special, but you don't know how or why. And just kind of like really getting introduced to our main character and seeing his, you know, just like who he is from yeah. the get go and, to, and his background. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And to merge your point with Elizabeth's, it, it is a patron. Like, I want to know how an infant supposedly defeated this like super powerful dark mm -hmm. wizard. Um, and so, I mean, that's a pretty bold choice as a writer to start out being like, this infant defeated a dark lord. <laughs> and you're right. like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. And I think me, most of us would like turn the page and be like, okay, and we're done reading this. <laughs> yeah. Do we have time for a quick talk on that, or should we save that for a later, a later conversation? Yeah. No. Go ahead. I've heard some really interesting theories um, as far as that. And so like major spoilers for later, not that we haven't already had some. Um, we all know that, that Snape was in love with Harry's mom and that Snape made Voldemort promise to spare Lily. Mm. And I've read some really interesting theories that, um, you know, like an unbreakable vow or some, you know, vow, not curse necessarily, but some magic was placed when Voldemort made that promise. And that him breaking that promise and killing Lily is what then gave Harry the power. Like, not just the mother's love, but that, like, breaking of that vow to Snape mm -hmm. and not spare it. Because, you know, he genuinely intended to keep it when he mm -hmm. made that vow. He wasn't going to kill her. But then she got in the way. She didn't listen. So he just blasted her and, you know, stepped over her, her body to get to Harry. Um, and that killing her, like, I don't know is what sets up the yeah because the also, also killing curse and not to i'm sorry i might want here um not to um like step on it but we really don't know what happens if an unbreakable vow is broken mm -mm. because snape fulfills oh. it later on so we you die you die yeah if you break it you die they, they mentioned that this is all covered okay yeah oh, so that would make sense then <laughs> Because, like, there are other mothers in the wizarding world who I'm sure have sacrificed themselves for their children, or mm -hmm. other mothers who have demonstrated great love. So that explanation of the mother's love is what saved Harry's life. Like, why hasn't that happened to anyone else before? So yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting theory. Uh, okay. I'm also afraid that if, if we go down that track to believe that, that it takes away from from the yeah, yeah no i think yeah. it absolutely could i love i i appreciate like theory crafting and stuff like that but i, I don't know that it's necessary i i feel like i feel like the book tells the story or the, the series tells the story well and completely enough that it's it's not really necessary like i think it i think it logically fits everything works without mm -hmm. without that uh, and maybe maybe that this time that a mother sacrifices herself for a child is unique or special because maybe it's directly with Voldemort and maybe mm -hmm. it's like consecutive like kills. So um, it, I, I don't know what, what makes it different than the killing of, you know, of, of all the killing that Voldemort did and sacrificing that may have gone on. But um, I do like to think that it's that's Lily who saved Harry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so good. All right. Excellent. Well, uh, my key takeaway is that we, we are introduced to Hagrid and his, um, integrity and his, you know, Dumbledore trust him to bring Harry on a motorbike to the Dursleys. And the key takeaway for me is that Hagrid is always going to be there for Harry. Um, not to get already, you know, sentimental in chapter one, book one, chapter one already of our Harry Potter series, but Hagrid's always going to be there. And so my favorite character of the chapter is Hagrid, um, for delivering Harry and, um, you know, setting it up that, that Hagrid is going to support Harry. So Hannah, who's your favorite character of the chapter? I would agree with you completely. I think it's Hagrid. Um, because like I said, he's the, like, you can see how upset he is when he hands Harry off and like how much he already loves Harry um, and like cares about his well-being. So I think that's why. Jake? 
Uh, for me, it's no question uh, Dumbledore. I, I love the way he's introduced. Like he's this this mysterious figure, uh, a lot of quirks. We don't know a whole lot about him yet. We get some of the goofy stuff like with lemon <laughs> drops and a, a scar yeah. in the shape of the London underground on his left knee or whatever. Like all this mm-hmm. funny, interesting stuff. Uh, but we still get that that uh, semblance of like he's he's someone powerful and and he knows more than he's letting on. And I think it just introduces him really well. He's I mean he's one of my favorite characters, but I, I love the way he's set up in this chapter. Uh, I agree. Elizabeth, who's your favorite ca- uh, character um, in the chapter? Well, I knew this question was coming, and um, I feel like I'm going to have ample opportunity to answer each one of those. So I went a little different route, and I went with Mr. Gersley um, because. Okay. He was described, um, you know, like we said at the beginning, um, his perspective, um, his point of view, which was really cool to see that. And um, we kind of see his like environment and um, shows us kind of the environment that Harry's going to be going into. Um, And I don't know, I really enjoyed reading about him. I think all the scenes with the Dursleys in general are some of my favorite um, within the whole series, so. I, I think that's a really good point. He's almost, I don't want to say a sympathetic character in this chapter, but compared yeah. to the other ones, the, the portrayal of him is like a little incongruous, you know, like you don't, mm-hmm. you don't dislike him in this one. He's just a normal guy going about his business. Yeah. Uh, obviously all that changes going forward. But right, <laughs> right. Yeah. I, feel like, I like him a lot more in this chapter than, mm-hmm. than any of the others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because uh, soon we learn, uh, you know, more about how they treat Harry and how they see the outside mm-hmm. world. And I think that, you know, perception of the Dursleys changes really quick. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so good. All right. Well, actually, I think that'll wrap up episode one of our Harry Potter edition of Disney Co. In the Know. So thanks for listening. However you're catching um, th- this episode, whether it be by watching or by listening, Uh, We thank you for listening and watching and let us know what we missed. Let us know what your thoughts are. Uh, Who was your favorite character of chapter one? What's your key takeaway? Um, Let us know what you disagree with us about and what you you do agree with us and follow us on Facebook at 407 and beyond vacation co and join in on the discussion on our Facebook group, uh, Disney co in the know. Um, And until next time, guys, uh, take care. Thanks a lot for a good episode and we'll see you in chapter two. Bye. 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 See you later.